CBS Sports HQ is built by the Home Depot. How doers get more done. Back here with Brian McFadden, Brad Crawford here to talk winners and losers. It's always a fun segment because it's always a wild day in college football. We had some upsets in the ACC. We had some games going down to the wire. Oregon hangs on. Some coaching mismatches here. Uh, bad decisions. Um, who's your biggest winner here on Saturday, BMAC? The game of the night. UGA hosting the Tennessee Volunteers. Uh, desperation was clearly in the minds of the Bulldogs, knowing and understanding they could not afford to lose. This was a playoff game because if you lose, you go home, you win, you keep your, ho your, your championship hopes alive. They were able to win in a convincing way. So when you look at what Georgia did today and they, oh, their overall resume, I think it's safe to say they went out. The final two games against UMass and Georgia Tech, they're in the playoffs. But none of that would have became a re would be an a thought if they did not win tonight against Tennessee. They won, and because of that, they're my biggest winner. The South Carolina and Shane Beamer, fourth-year coach of the Gamecocks, that's my biggest winner today in Week 12. I mean, the whole reason we're talking about a possible three-loss team even being in the playoff conversation is because of what South Carolina has done the last month. Three straight wins over top 25 teams, seven and three overall. Now Gamecocks are going to be inside the top 20 Tuesday night as the highest ranked three loss team. Just came back and beat Missouri today on a late uh, touchdown pass from Lenora Sellers. Redshirt freshman, five TDs, 350 yards. I mean, come on, fellas. This, this is an offense that was supposed to struggle a little bit this year with a new quarterback, but Gamecocks are playing well. Like I said, 7-3 and three overall now. And had they not lost to LSU by three points, Alabama by two points, Ole Miss at home, just win one of those three games, we're talking about the Gamecocks, Brian, being at, you know, one of those five SEC teams strong in the mix. Yeah, it's too bad that uh, they lost one of those games because you're right. They'd be Close a fun games. team. Yes. They would be one of those teams you would not want to face in a 12-team playoff. Yeah. You'd, we'd all circle. we go, who's the team you don't want to play in the playoff? South, South Carolina. Carolina. South yep. Kakalaki, we do not want to face the Gamecocks. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding you. And if, you, if, they were, if they had to host a game in Columbia... Stop it. They got a dual threat Stop quarterback it. that's playing with a lot of confidence. They got an outstanding defensive line. But he all, he's, the he's a smart they, head coach, too. Smart head coach. He, he, he learned from his father. So he, he doesn't get in his – you talk about egos all the time. He's not an ego guy. No. He, he ta he'll take the three points when it's, when it's afforded to him. All right. As for your biggest loser, BMAC, who disappointed you the most in, in week eight? Because there was a couple of teams here that stand out to me. It was. It was. But for me, I'm going to the Big 12. Kansas State. Oh, yeah. Kansas State. Uh, um, I think they were a seven and a half point favorite. Yeah, they were in my parlay. In this match, they busted it. They busted it. Yeah, they did. Right? I thought they were going to win. I thought, I thought we all thought they would win. Take Being care of at home and understanding, and knowing what was at stake, still having a Big 12 title hopes right in front of them. Granted, they needed to win and needed a little bit of help, but they still had a legit chance to compete for a Big 12 championship. And tonight's matchup to Arizona State got off to a slow start, tried to claw back, but ran out of time. And a, a very, very disappointing loss for Kansas State when you look at the expectations. Once the season started, many felt like this was a team. They were well balanced. They could run the football, experienced quarterback, great backfield. And guess what? They allowed big games that slipped through their cracks. And the biggest one that pretty much put a halt in their playoff hopes, playoff aspirations, happened tonight against Arizona State. And because of that, losing tonight, they have no shot to compete for a Big 12 title. They're my biggest loser. And speaking of disappointing, I mean, look at Brian Kelly and LSU. A couple weeks ago, they went to College Station, lost that game, blown out at home against Alabama under the lights at Tiger Stadium. Then they go to Gainesville. Now Florida's one win away from bowl eligibility yeah. after beating LSU today. So Brian Kelly, one of the highest paid coaches in college football, has not earned that $10 million a year this year, man. He's lost now three consecutive games. LSU's going to be playing in a New Year's Day Bowl, not a, not a playoff bowl. So LSU right now is my biggest loser. And, and Garrett Nussmeyer, just the last couple starts, man, he has mm -hmm. not been the quarterback that we thought he was. Yeah, the last uh, couple coaches that lost three games they didn't in make the season, it. they ran them out of town. Yeah. They even paid their buyout. Like the last one, Ed Orgeron in 2021, they paid him $17 million. Yep. I, we, we, I talked about this earlier, though. Brian Kelly's buyout is $62 million, about $62 million. I, I don't know if he's any safe. booster is coming up with that, Brad, yeah, to, to get him out of no, Baton safe. Rouge. He's safe. 
He's safe. Him, him and Mike Morbell are safe because of those big paydays. And Kirby Smart, too. Always running either of those guys out of town, no matter what they're, at least for the time being. Some people want to run uh, Deion Sanders out of town. I don't really get it, but, you know, some people <laughs> do. And uh, they got a they got a, an absolute star there, Travis Hunter. He entered as the favorite to win the Heisman. And against Utah, he became the first player this season with a rushing touchdown and an interception in the same game. Meantime, Boise State running back Ashton Genty, another game with three rushing touchdowns. Sixth game of the season with three rushing touchdowns and 125 rushing yards in every game this season. This guy is a model of consistency. To me, it's down to these two guys. Mm. Travis Hunter, yep. Ashton Genty, yep. one from the Big 12, one from the Mountain West. Where does the Heisman race stand after Saturday, BMAC? I still have Travis Hunter number one above Ashton Genty. And the reason why is that he's, he's continuing to play two different positions at a high level. Like, you would think fatigue would show up eventually. For him, no. He's, he's a freak. He, yeah, he, he's doing something that we've never seen done before. And I don't want to take anything away from Ashton Genty, but when you look at what Travis Hunter did today and you look at how his team has become a dominant team, that ha has to help. That has to help his case in winning this Heisman because we all know the Heisman is an individual award, but your overall team success means something. And I'm not saying Boise State, they're not having team success. But when you look at what Colorado is doing and how dominant they've become over the last three or four ball games, and it starts and it stops with what Travis Hunter has been able to do, my goodness, it's hard for me to overlook what he is doing because we've never seen it done before, and it's actually, he's actually being productive for a legit playoff caliber team. We couldn't make that case in September because they were still trying to figure things out. But here in November, you can le legit make that case that this is a legit playoff caliber team, and he is playing to a level in, in which we've never seen before. And that's the biggest key. I think a lot of us thought at best Colorado would be six and six, seven yeah. and five, get to a bowl game this season. But they are a playoff, not only contender, but probably a front runner now in the Big 12 because nobody believes in this unbeaten BYU team right now. And I think the biggest thing, too, is who is watching Ashton Genty's games? I mean, Tennessee, Georgia took the primetime spotlight. Oregon, Wisconsin was close in the fourth quarter. Meanwhile, Genty's rushing for 160 yards and three touchdowns, and no one online is talking about it. So that's, that's key as well. Travis Hunter has the spotlight. Colorado is always week-to-week -week appointment viewing. And right now, Genty's just... You know, he, eclipsing 100 yards every game with multiple scores, but he's just not generating the hype that Travis Hunter always does game to game. Yeah, I can believe that. I, I will say, though, that people can find clips. I mean, this day and age, I mean, we're yeah. in 2024, like, there's all social media platforms. Like, you're, and, seeing, you're seeing Ashton Genty. You're seeing the hype video. Like, if you want to go and really do a deep dive on, on Heisman, um, candidates and you want to look at their tape and you want to look at video, it's easy to find. I mean, yeah. the, the people that have the votes, it's going to be right in front of them. And I'll say this, tonight Ashton Genty had a real good game. He did. But he didn't give us what he gave us early on. The 150s, the 160s, the 170s, the 180s, whatever the case may be. You know, he was almost 200 yards and things like that. Uh, I think he finished, he didn't even surpass his rushing prop. He did, but that's out of control. I, I understand that, but when like you talk about, that's a little, that's I, I think that's. for a guy like Ashton Genty. You need him what, to run for 200 yards every game? But what I'm saying is for a guy like Ashton Genty, and Brad made, made a, a critical point, because of the team he's playing for, it's not a national Power Four team, he has to do more than what a running back would need to do You're at right. Tennessee or yep. at Alabama. Right. That's right. all I'm saying. Yep. Because what he did today was great, but to win that Heisman, you still got to be in the echelon, high top echelon of numbers when you look at the position you play and when you look at the school that you play for. Even though he has no control over that, but it's not, they're not on a national stage week in and week out like a Colorado, like a Dylan Gabriel, you know, because of the teams that they play with. Well, both are projected first round picks and uh, we heard Ashton Genty want to go play with uh, Kyler Murray and have the short man Kings. Uh, the short Kings running the ball, right? Like that's what uh, Connor Murray, first round pick, play baseball, uh, Heisman Trophy winner, go play alongside him. James Ooh. Connor, good back, but I'm just saying, you're Ashton Genty want to be in there. Connor I'm not trying to move anything. I'm just telling you what Ashton Genty said <laughs> to play alongside <laughs> the short King. That'd Kyler be a Murray. nice backfield. All right, that, I'm, that's what I'm saying. That's all it would be.
winners and losers. Brad Crawford, Brian McFadden here on CBS Sports HQ presented by the Home Depot. As you take a look at the current odds to win the Heisman Trophy, Travis Hunter, the heavy favorite at minus 370 when you consider it's plus 360 for Ashton Genty. Look, some things could change here over the final two weeks, but Travis Hunter looking to be the, just the second player in Colorado history to win the Heisman Trophy, the first since the late great Rashawn Salam.